And many, many people who worked with Karajan, who played under Karajan, people from the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, told me that Karajan instigated people to keep the notes as much as they could in order, as much as they could, to resemble human voice. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome Andrea Colombini today. <laughs> My name is Julia Binick, I'm from the Karel Institute and today we are talking about your experience with the Maestro <laughs> yeah. and also about Luca, the Puccini birthplace. <laughs> yes, definitely so. And you know, my experience with the Maestro is quite strange because I have never met him actually. Mm -hmm. But I'm considered one of the top experts because I've, I've written a book about him. I, I am one of the finest collectors of, of all his recordings. But you know, the, the thin line between fetishism and appreciation must be always marked. It is very important. I love Karian. Karian is always been very important for me because my job has been a conductor. So Karen has always been a source of inspiration. He has always been a great example to follow because with what I've realized, of course, in a completely different scale, I, I followed his path and I followed his teachings. I started conducting uh, quite late because I started when I was 20, in 1994, I was uh, 26 years of age because I started my musical career quite late, because I wanted to be a conductor, but my life led me somewhere else. Uh, Karajan died in 1989, so it was too early for me to meet him, but definitely I started listening to his records when I was eight years of age, because my grandfather had a lot of records, and I still remember a big one, but you know, this big vinyl thing, you know, this, mm -hmm. with Karajan and the Philharmonia Orchestra of London performing uh, George Friedrich Endel's Water Music in the <laughs> arrangement of Hamilton Harty and it was completely taken by the music and then I started listening to classical music and I was eight years of age and then you know the, 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 the love went to Mozart and then Beethoven and then quite strangely quite late I arrived at Puccini so Puccini <laughs> was uh, Puccini which was very loved in my family because my family all my family were, they, they were great opera lovers at that time, you know, they had a great fight between Callas and Tebaldi. And okay. my grandfather was a great Calasian. He loved Maria Callas. And Maria Callas in Beethoven, in, in, in Puccini, apart from Tosca, uh, she was not particularly brilliant. You know, we had better examples. She was a, a great singer. Mm -hmm. But for instance, Mirella Freni did much better in Puccini because she was more the, 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 the classical kind of voice. But nevertheless, we listened a lot of Puccini, but he arrived at Puccini very late. I started from Mozart, Endel and Beethoven, and starting from there, the approach with Karajan was immediate. Records, you know, Deutsche Grammophon, the, the, the yellow cartouche of Deutsche Grammophon, it was something I loved dearly. And uh, I started buying records, of course, listening to music. I, I studied piano at the time, but definitely I wanted to be a conductor. This came much earlier. When I was six years of age, they asked me, what do you want to do in your own living? when you're going to be grown up. Yeah. And I simply said, I want to be a conductor and they want the guards from Buckingham Palace to work for me. <laughs> At 26 years of age, I was a conductor because I started conducting and the guards worked for me because as organizer, I am the agent for Italy of the bands of the Household Division and the Scottish <laughs> Division. So the, I, I realized what I wanted to do. But Karajan was always in my mind. I tried, I, I wrote him a wonderful letter in, in 1988 for his 80th birthday and he sent me back his wonderful card, you know, and the, the, the printed card with his signature on, thanking me for the, for the birthday. 
Oh, that's a beautiful present. Oh no, really, it is. It, it's a fantastic. I still remember when I got the envelope. I was I was happy as a child. I, I was basically a child because I was what I was twenty years of age. So I could get, <laughs> get a letter, and I had no chance to go to Salzburg because at that time I had no money enough to go to Salzburg. Mm -hmm. Then I started coming to Salzburg later on. Let's say at the end of the nineties during the Claudia Bardo okay. tenure of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. So yeah, but but I started watching all the concerts of the, all the great conductors while I was conducting myself. But something very interesting is uh, I started working very, very, very early after the, the high school because I went to university, but I also worked because I was in great demand. I was a professional in the financial branch, but I studied music as well and organized concerts. So I had a yes. very busy life. <laughs> and uh, thanks to very good job, I had good money and I could buy a lot of VHS of rehearsals of mm -hmm. great conductors, also career. Can you understand when these VHS had a very limited distribution, what sort of great teaching this was for a young man who wanted to be a conductor, with the idea of being a conductor, who studied piano, who studied composition, harmony or whatever, and then, without being able to attend regular courses of conducting, you get these videos, at that time, think about, we are talking about 1989, 1990, they yes. were very limited, nobody had the... Now everything is on YouTube, everything is easy to be found. Not at that time. Yeah. But I got an immense trade watching the rehearsals of Karajan, first but also Karl Böhm and Leonard Bernstein, mm -hmm. Evgeny Maravinsky, the great Russian conductor Karajan appreciated so much. I got the ropes from there, because when I then faced the orchestra, and I'm facing the orchestra, I put into practice what I got from them, especially from Karajan, and believe me, it and, works. And what did you got from him? Basically, the way of shaping the phrases. It is very important, I mean, this is basic, and people will never be able to understand okay. why it is so easy to understand when you're listening to a Karajan interpretation. It is easy. I can give you a lot of examples, but I give you, examples are much better than words. Yes. Pa 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 ta 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 pa 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 ta 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 pa 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 Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Every conductor, every orchestra, it is just like that when you have the bar dividing one tact from mm -hmm. another, one, one bar from another, there's a little bar on the score, you perceive the thing. Even though if there is a legatura, if there is a sign of, of, of legato, you perceive the break. Karayan, it is always pa 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 It is just like a slight overdubbing and many, many people who worked with Karajan, who played under Karajan, people from the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, told me that Karajan instigated people to keep the notes as much as they could in order, as much as they could, to resemble human voice, first. And second thing, do not emphasize poses. Even though you have a quarter pause, you have one sixteenth pause, do not emphasize that because otherwise, if you emphasize it too much, one part of a second, every bar, is going to be 30 seconds at the end of the piece or one minute at the end of the piece and the metronome is going down. Third, do not break the phrase. This is what you told the musicians. When you watch the score in front of you, you have the bars dividing yes. one measure from another. That's not a break mentally. This is why when Anne-Sophie Mütter said Karajan was a great master of psychology, she was absolutely right. Because this is a psychological question. Reading the mind of the performer, the musician, and telling him do not emphasize the bar because the bar is going to give you a little pause in your mind and you break the sound. Keep the note as much as you can. It is not a complete legato. Many people said Karen yes. was the master of legato. No, music must go forward, always. Do not make it static, make it go. Yes. The example I gave you, if you listen to normal conductors, even young conductors, they play very well, they conduct very well, they play what is written in the score, but the effect is different. Pa -pa 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 -ti -ti -ta -ta -pa 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 because this is how it is made. The sections are entering, first, second, violas. Everything must be singing, flowing, going. This is what I got from Karaya. But did you practice with the recordings? No. Remember, when I practice 
This is another thing I learned from him. I still remember him telling one precious thing which should be done by everybody. He said, I can sit down in my room like this, crossing legs and listening to Tristan and his old completely. Yeah, in my head, no recording needed. Yeah. I've never practiced with recordings. You practice with the score, you listen to the recording. This is the great limit of many conductors, I have to say. I consider myself as an amateur conductor, but for one reason. Because a mère en français means to love. I am an amateur conductor because I love conducting. It is not strictly my job. I love doing it. I wanted to do it. If you have the burning flame within you, you will be a conductor. If you study, you go to university, you get masters, but you have not the burning flame within yes. you, you will never be a conductor because the moment you jump onto the podium, the orchestra will realize that you are not a conductor. Yes. This is the starting point. Recordings are important for listening. The experience of listening is so important. Listening to recordings, especially live recordings. Listening to live concerts, it's important. Watching the colleagues, what they do or what they don't do. It is always important, always. But then you must have your own idea in your mind. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it is just like talking to another person. You have your own ideas. The person says something different and out of the blue you say, Jesus Christ, she is right. Possibly I was wrong. Let me rethink. <laughs> you know that Karaya yeah. is admission. He listened to the recordings of his colleagues in order to see how they resolve the problems. This is something some conductors today would never even admit to do. They don't do it, but if they did it, they wouldn't say they do it. Yeah. And Karajan listened to Charles Munk for all the French interpretations, he listened to Evgeny Mravinsky for the Russian music, yeah. which was very important. He listened to the great Italian conductor Tullio Serafin for the Italian opera, not Toscanini. Tullio Serafin, he listened to Toscanini as well, but yeah. Tullio Serafin, because Tullio Serafin was the greatest expert about Italian voices. He was the maestro of Callas di Stefano Bergonzi. He listened to all his recordings in order to see how they solved technical problems. This is not uh, charlatanry, as somebody said about Karajan. This is an act of immense humility. The greatest conductor of all times openly admitted, I listen to my colleagues. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's incredible. So recordings can be important, but never study upon recordings. Even though Karajan said, at my time, we went to the theatre, we listened to a lot of performances because there were a lot of performances, we listened to the others. Now you have the records, you can listen to everything at home, so possibly it can be of some use sometimes if you want to prepare something you don't know. Yeah. If you have to prepare, I don't know, Rosalka, for instance, or, or the, the, the Macropolis case, whatever, you must <laughs> listen to it because otherwise you, know, you will never understand that. Yeah. It is stupid not to listen to, to the thing. Then you give your own interpretation studying the score on paper. Yeah. But it is in my opinion, it is something that you must do independently. Going back to the recordings, yeah. the birthplace of Puccini is Luca, yes. also your birthplace. Yes. <laughs> yes. What is the speciality in the interpretation of Karajan conducting Puccini, especially this, La Bohème? This is important. This is very important. This is a point that I have spoken about many times in my life because I've given conferences about Puccini and Karajan. If you listen to the normal interpretation of Puccini, the name coming to your mind is Toscanini. Very wrong, because Toscanini had a very, very, very limited vision of the global color and sound of Giacomo Puccini. Toscanini was renowned to be very rhythmically precise, and he was rhythmically precise, but the color lacks. Possibly it is also due to, you know, the, the, the recording techniques or whatever, but no, it is not only that. It is that the sound Toscanini had in mind was not an Europe a European sound. Giacomo Puccini, if you know his story, his biography, he took everything from everywhere. He took French Impressionist music and he put it in his music. He took 
Russian and Slavonic yes. music that he took Richard Wagner and he put everything into his music and the palette of colors is immensely bigger than Giuseppe Verdi. That's yes. the reason why for me, and I say it bluntly, Verdi is not number one, Puccini is number <laughs> one. Karajan was an international man who loved Farbe, colors in the orchestra. He yes. was able to emphasize all these in Puccini. The classical Karajan sound. Yes. <laughs> Karajan sound, it, it, it is a subject I, I'm very happy to speak about because I, I've just read a book of the, of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra speaking about Karajan and one of the leaders of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, very respected by Karajan, Werner Hink, he said Karajan, Karajan was a clang fetishist. I, I read this statement, which was done in a positive way, do not misunderstand me, but I said what should a conductor be, if not a clang fetishist. A conductor is there to give the right colors to everything he conducts. The right colors. Karajan was accused, oh, Bach is sounding like Stravinsky, or Vivaldi is sounding like Musorsky. Totally wrong. Karajan had the simple conception that music should be first and foremost beautiful. Music is beautiful. Music is not coarse, it's not harsh. Music is beautiful. It means that a fortissimo is a fortissimo. And you know, Karajan fortissimos are <laughs> immense. But they are always as stylish and proper. Puccini. This sound, the use of the waltz, which is so basic, which is something Puccini adored. That's why he was so loved in Vienna, because Puccini understood Viennese music and the Viennese mentality so much. You know, he was accused to be a spy during the First World War, because he went to Vienna so many times to oversee all the, 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 the mise en scène, the, 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 the Vienna of Oper. Mm -hmm. that all the people said, why are you going to Vienna? They are enemies, we are fighting against them. And they said, sorry, money is money, music is music, it's another thing. <laughs> and he went there, but he loved Vienna. He loved Viennese music, and Karajan was the only one who was able to emphasize all that. Take La Bohème. La Bohème, but not only the Berlin Philharmonic one, which is easy. It was done in study with Pavarotti, Freni, Giaurov, my dear friend Rolando Panerai, whom mm -hmm. I knew very well. Last interview of Rolando Panerai was done for me, and we spoke about Karajan for two hours. Oh. He told me fantastic <laughs> stories about Karajan. But that's fine, it's a recording, and a recording sometimes can be a fake. Karajan was particular because he made everything in very long takes, very, very long takes. Yes. He didn't want to correct. But a recording is always something you can manipulate. One microphone off, one microphone on, you yeah. emphasize the sound. Listen to the live recordings at the Vienna State Opera in 1963, the one after the big strike when they stopped the first performance of La Bohème. They are fantastic, such a fantastic sound. And we have Gianni Maffeo, the one who then recorded the video for La Scala. You still have Mirella Freni, you have Rolando Panerai, you have the same people which later on recorded the Bohème. Listen to the live Bohème in 1975 in Salzburg. Okay. With Pavarotti and Freni, all the same people, and Panerai, all the same people. And then listen to the live in 1977 at the Vienna State Opera again. You listen a great sound, which it, and it is imprecise, because there are some little mistakes, people who are not exact, because this is implied in live performances. Karajan was not the no. perfect one. Nobody is perfect. Mistake is always there. Not in a record. A record, you're correct, it's easy. <laughs> but the sound of Puccini, the color, the end, the, the emphasis on melody, but also on the inner lines. Madame Butterfly is another great achievement of Karajan. It is so beautiful. So you don't have a um, favorite recording of no, Puccini the, of him? La Bohème is La Bohème. La Bohème is La Bohème. You know, I, I have the, the CD of La Bohème at home. I bought it in 1990. It just <laughs> came out. It cost a fortune. And the first time I met Rolando Panerai was in 1990. And we have met some officially four times, and then we have met in other occasions, but I had not the, the coffret with me, I had not the, 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 the CD package with me. But every time we met, 
on, on the libretto. He signed and he gave me his dedication. So he had four dedications in four different years, five, six years in the distance. <laughs> well, yes. So for me, La Boheme is La Boheme. But when we speak about La Boheme, you, we speak about the Berlin La Boheme, but then you have the, the, the one with La Scala, the movie with Zeffirelli, the staging. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. You know, I was the first conductor to be also the first conductor and director of a full staging of La Boheme at my theatre, the Teatro del Giglio in Lucca, one of the theatres where Giacomo Puccini used to perform his operas and he had his opera performed. Okay. And I staged La Boheme and was very proud to do the sceneries and to do the staging and to do... And they trained and the, the footstep of Karajan. Oh yeah, no, no, definitely. <laughs> but Karajan never touched La Boheme because he said La Boheme is too complicated to be here and to be there. That's why I always trusted Franco Zeffirelli to be the best and of course I got some ideas, but then I gave my own interpretation. But in the second act, I had 140 people on stage to be led. And believe me, when you are in the pit and then you are there, you do rehearsals with the piano, but then when you are there and the band is coming and the kids are, are screaming, and it, it's, good, it's good fun. <laughs> like everything. Madame yeah. Butterfly is beautiful, is absolutely outstanding. But you know, Madame Butterfly is something connected to my own personality. I'm getting closer now to Madame Butterfly because I've always thought that the first act was a little bit weak for the duet. So stupid I was. <laughs> it's such fantastic music. Tosca. Yes. Karajan. Tosca. There's the great grape. This is where... <laughs> he left the world. He left the world performing Puccini because he never performed a mask and ballet. No, the mask and ballet was just the, the, the rehearsals. He performed Puccini and I have those two recordings. I have also the recordings of the year before, 1988. The cast was not exactly perfect. This is why I had to recall Pavarotti to perform Cavaradossi, because the year before he had Luis Lima, I think, performing mm -hmm. Cavaradossi. And there was Fiamma Izzo D'Amico, a fantastic voice, so criticized by somebody in Italy, stupidly, because he was a fantastic singer, a young singer, you know, giving faith and trust to young people. This is why he was a great he always thought about the future, never thought about the past. Easy to call Pavarotti, okay, I'm in difficulty. Last year I did a not perfect Tosca. I call the big gun. Yeah. Everybody's going to say I'm going to be good. And this yeah. is what happened. And Tosca is fantastic. In the duet, in the first act, I will never forget it because I've listened to that recording very carefully. In the duet of the first act, Pavarotti is getting the tempo back and back and back and back and Karajan stubbornly goes on with his own tempo and Josephine Bastos, she goes with Karajan and Pavarotti goes back and you know slower and slower and so on and Karajan goes on. It's beautiful but the color of that Tosca, the color of all Toscas of Karajan is incredible. Slow for the Italian taste, slow tempos for the Italian taste but it is emphasizing the Baroque side of Tosca is beautiful, yeah. unreachable. Possibly the only comparable version to Callas de Sabata, which is the reference for Tosca. And then we have Turandot at the end. Turandot at the end, which is so incredibly beautiful. The choice of my friend Katia Ricciarelli as Turandot was highly criticized, but he was very intelligent as usual, because he said, I can't imagine a girl aged 17, because this is what Turandot is, don't forget it. She's not a woman. Turandot is a girl. Okay. The voice must be like that. It's heavy. You know that Turandot, the role, is only 14 and a half minutes of singing. <laughs> but they are the worst <laughs> ever conceived. Yes. The worst ever conceived. So, vocally speaking, in the recording, there are some imprecisions. I mean, the voice sometimes is flat here and there, but it happens. It's the general spirit of the recording. His Turandot is a Klimt painting. You had all the colors, you had everything there. And when she sings, when Katia sings his area in Questa Reggio, mm -hmm. listen to, I've, I've shivers the thing about that. O principi che allunghe carovane di sound with, with this glockenspiel just in the back. It's so heartbreaking because all conductors there 
they all do very slow, but it, it really makes us see the long caravan in the desert of the princes approaching. <laughs> it, it's, it's beautiful. It's just a moment. The masks, the trio of the masks in that opera, it's absolutely it's a difficult piece of Puccini, but it's absolutely fantastic with all the colors, with all the right expressions. The Vienna Philharmonic playing at a level that possibly never reached in Puccini anymore. You know that there is another recording of Turandot very close to that, done with Lorin Mazel live, mm -hmm. two years later, I think, with Katia Ricciarelli performing Liu this time. Same orchestra, Carreras instead of Domingo, mm -hmm. but believe me, Orchestra seems a completely different one, completely different one. It's a live recording, I understand. Here it's a studio recording, but you know, Puccini is absolutely in his chords. He was able to do the right sound of Puccini. I've always had his sound in mind. My tempos, I must say, are a little bit quicker than Carian's. <laughs> A little bit. But, but that's you. <laughs> it's me, that, that's the reason why you may listen to him, yeah. but you must not imitate anybody. Yeah. You have that's your own true. idea. The important thing is also putting tempos in the right relation to the singers on stage. Listen to the tempos he has in Vienna, live in 1964. Boop, 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 boop. Go, 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 go. You know why? Because, because the breath of the singers must be always taken under control. Studio is easy. Stage is different. 